Hi everyone, so in this video we'll take a look at the uh, physical modifications I've made uh, to this MMU2 um, clone. Um, we will mainly take a look at the merger which is uh, finally working uh, properly, uh, but we'll also speak about the overall uh, multi-material upgrade. Uh, we will also uh, I will also make a quick update on where I'm at uh, in the on the firmware side of things, the challenges I'm facing, and how I am expecting to solve them. So for the people that are new to this channel, uh, what I'm doing is I'm simply making a clone of the MMU2, uh, but also improving it based on the uh, user feedback from the people that currently have the MMU2. So as an example, I don't have any cutting blade because. It was part of the physical design of the MMU2, but they didn't even uh, use it uh, in the firmware, and it's simply there uh, for absolutely nothing. Uh, then the carriage system may not be the ideal solution, but that's why I'm trying to use a merger. Um, so yeah, I'm basically building on what they have already done and try to improve it. I also have two main goals for it. Uh, the first one being I want this to work on any printer. Uh, the easiest way I found to solve this was to use a brand new mainboard. Um, so, as you can see, this one is a fairly high quality one. It's the SKR Pro V1.1. Um, and you may think, if I'm using a new mainboard and drivers, uh, won't this be super expensive? Uh, and actually, no, I'm trying to stay within $150. Uh, and that's a great price when you take into account that I am um, using a new mainboard and a new touchscreen. Um, and new drivers, so that's a lot of new things and that are actually an improvement for your printer and that don't really come into the uh, actual physical uh, MMU. So uh, that's why this is probably $70 uh, max and the my price or projected price is $150. So now that this is uh, said and done, let's get right into it. So. Uh, first, like I said, we'll take a look at the merger. So um, the first thing you may notice if you've watched my previous video uh, is that I am not using uh, the switch. So why is that? So uh, initially, on my initial design, I was thinking about placing a switch right there uh, in that little hole. Uh, and the way it would work is that when the filament would pass uh, through this hole, uh, it would push against the switch, triggering it, and this way we would have a sensor that could tell us uh, whether the filament had been correctly loaded or not. Um, this was mainly to replace the finder sensor, um, or to make uh, have a similar feature as the finder sensor, but I actually chosen to go another way, uh, because having a hole directly inside that merger uh, was causing way too many problems, and uh, it would actually cause more problems than it would solve by having a sensor right in there. Uh, so that's why I decided to go without it, and um, yeah, uh, that's basically it for the uh, switch. Now I had a few other things that I needed to do in order to have this working properly. Uh, I had to increase the clearances uh, for the uh, filament uh, tubes. Um, so not for the filament, uh, not not for the PTFE tube insert. So for the people that have already watched the video, they know that this works by having PTFE tube inserts. Um, almost all the way, so right to about there. And once you get to that point and it starts to merge with the other filament, uh, it's simply um, a three-putted plastic tube. Um, why did I use PTFE tube insert? PTFE tube insert. So the main reason is that it is uh, way smoother and that it will cause uh, less friction because these are um, not 3D printed, so they don't have the same problems. Uh, than 3D printed parts have. So uh, what I needed to do was to have the output hole of these PTFE tubes be smaller than the input hole uh, of the 3D printed plastic tubes. And initially that was not the case, they were equal. Uh, so that was causing some problems because you had the PTFE tube and then it was going into a smaller tube directly so there was a small ridge and the filament would bump against that and not be able to pass through correctly. So I uh, made the plastic 3 printed tube bigger so now it's uh, 2.5 millimeters um, and that's a lot when you're thinking about the fact that we're using 1.75 millimeters uh, filament but when you take into account that this is 3D printed it's 
actually really not that much because when you 3D print things, um, they tend to bend on the top, the holes. So it's actually a bit squished. It's not a perfect circle. And uh, this way, the actual diameter from top to bottom is smaller than the one that you have uh, chosen. And uh, this is why I need such a big clearance as well. And the other reason why is that because you have a bit of... Uh, Retraction. This is not so true of PLA, maybe a few percent, but if you're printing this in uh, ABS, it's going to be way bigger. Um, now, uh, I've also designed a way to connect it to the main body. So how it works is you have all those PTFE tube inserts that go into the main body, uh, and then uh, you have two screws to secure it in place, uh, and those screws are held in place by two uh, nuts that are actually inserted inside the um, body. So I'm going to show you by loading um, the green and then the black filament that it works perfectly properly. So right now you can see it's basically almost no friction. Uh, I would say that it is similar to a regular extruder, at least uh, the ones that you can find on the Ender 3 and on the Anet E10 in terms of resistance. Um, that's probably because I still don't have the uh, idler set to the filament position, but I believe that the friction caused by this will be small enough to the, the, the extruder will have the power to push the filament through and that we won't need a second extruder. But if we need, I have another um, motor control on the board, uh, so that means that this wouldn't even be a problem. Uh, one of the cool thing, cool thing about having PTFE tube inserts uh, that I didn't realize at first but that I am glad to see is that it adds a lot of uh, resistance and structure to this entire build because it's like um, having uh, some pieces that go through both uh, plastic parts and this creates a way more sturdy build and as you can see this little piece of plastic that is kind of hanging there and hold only by two screws has a lot of resistance and it doesn't bend much or at least it doesn't bend enough to be of any concern and it is um, really sturdy so I'm really happy with how the merger turned out. Uh, now you may remember that we don't have any way of sensing whether the filament has been correctly loaded. Uh, at that point I believe that this uh, system will be reliable enough uh, in order to not um, in order to not use um, not have any sensing method. method. Uh, but if I do uh, I will still go another way than having a s little switch uh, in there because this is not uh, super appropriate for uh, uh, filament detection. I will use an aftermarket one which are like a few dollars and I will place it um, either right at the end of the merger or closer to the extruder uh, depending on um, the setup, whether I'm going direct drive or uh, with uh, the little MMU uh, as the extruder itself. So um, that's it for the merger. Uh, now we'll talk about the uh, entire physical aspect of this project. Okay, uh, so basically the thing to know is that I'm almost done. Uh, at least I believe that we are really close uh, to a functional prototype, at least on the physical side of things. So uh, everything is working as it should. Uh, there's only one last little thing that I need to fix and I'm going to show you right now. It is that when the idler has uh, a filament selected, uh, you can see the space between these two is way too big. And that means that there's going to be way too much pressure put onto the idler and onto the, uh, the uh, motors when this is going to be closed with the, these uh, spring-loaded screws. Uh, and this week will cause 100% um, failure uh, in the uh, idler rotation. So uh, what I simply need to do is like what I did with the extruder teeth uh, that were a bit different. I need to move in uh, maybe 1.75 or a bit more, maybe 2 millimeters um, inside. So I need to make them higher uh, compared to the MMU. And this way this, we won't have this gap and it will work like it should. Uh, and that means that we're basically done uh, with all the physical modifications, uh, at least until now and until we have we are able to test the actual uh, thing with the entire firmware and when it will be placed uh, onto the printer. 
Okay, so now I'm going to give you a quick update on where I'm at on the uh, firmware side of things. Uh, but first, you may have noticed that I have a new microphone arm. So first, at first, my microphone was placed on um, a tripod uh, that was initially made for a phone stand. And uh, I had to print, 3 print a little adapter in order to be able to put my microphone on that. And that was really not an optimal solution. Uh, that's why I have this um, setup right now, and it also gives me the ability to A, be uh, a bit in a more natural position, um, be a bit further back because my camera doesn't have uh, any autofocus, and it focuses a bit in the background and less in the foreground, that's better. But the main reason why this is useful is that now that if when I'm doing a similar setup, uh, but with also a physical uh, things to look at, you know, with the little uh, droid cam, uh, and with the second camera source, I can move uh, to the uh, actual physical part of the video where I show you how it works uh, really easily because I usually have it on the side, so about right there, maybe a bit further. And I can take my mic with me uh, without too many problems. And this is really useful. So um, yeah, now let's get into the uh, modifications I've made up until now. So um, for the people that don't have haven't seen this, uh, I'm basically creating a new toolchain function uh, that takes over the regular one uh, and it simply uh, checks for every case so it can have five values um, so for the five different filaments that are going to be loaded inside the MMU2 and um, at first I was simply printing serial messages to check that I had everything working right and that it was uh, sensing like uh, that I was doing the right thing and that I knew that it was actually changing to the specific fill limit I wanted when I send the correct G-code command. So I was sending the different commands like T0 and it was printing change to filament hashtag one and that meant that my code was working correctly. So now that that was done, uh, I was able to start uh, doing actual uh, controlling the physical um, multi-material upgrade. So um, how did I do that? At first, I was thinking about using uh, the G-code uh, uh, file that had a command in it and a function in it that was process subcommands now. Uh, and it, the input was a char, uh, so I used PSTR to convert the, uh, the uh, string into a char. And uh, you would put simply G-code right into that, and it would run it directly. It was like kind of pause the print and run that G-code. And uh, what I would do is simply like move the extruder zero back, then change extruder one from five degrees, so that would be the idler, and then re-insert uh, the filament. Um, but the problem is uh, G-code has uh, some limitations, and this is not the way it should be done uh, if you want to have some complex controls and actually go outside of the regular 3D printer with three axes and one extruder. So. Um, what I wanted to do initially is like have a basic uh, movement function, uh, then use the extruder I wanted to move. Well, it's not the extruder, but it's plugged into the extruder, um, and uh, that's it. And then specify how much I wanted to move. Uh, but this has its limitation. The first first one is uh, I cannot select which extruder I want. And in order to choose which extruder to move, uh, what you need to do is, in G-code is use the actual tool change function that I want to change. So let's say I want to move the extruder one, and then I want to move the extruder zero. So extruder one would be the the uh, actual extruder, the one with the gears, and extruder one is uh, the one with the idler on it. I don't know if I mix up the numbers, but whatever. Uh, it's the same expansion. So the first thing I need to do is move, let's say, the actual extruder back three times to load the filament outside of the nozzle. So to take the filament outside of the nozzle and um, you have the merger and needs to be uh, like still loaded inside the uh, NMU, but it needs to be out of the merger because you cannot merge two filaments if there's already one in. Um, so I would basically move the extruder motor back. So that would be command G0, E50, or 500, depending on like the, the steps uh, per millimeters uh, that I've set, uh, or anywhere in between. 
And then I will need to change tool. So I will need to go to the second extruder. So that would be T1, for example. I would send the command T1. But the problem is I'm redefining the, what the T1 does. Uh, I'm basically changing what tool change does. So I cannot stay with the uh, G code uh, commands uh, that are already inside Marlin. I have to go uh, a, a bit deeper into Marlin and uh, go straight to the stepper motor controls. So what I'm going to do next um, is uh, try to uh, find um, basically how everything works. So I know that there's a parser and it processes the different commands, but I need to find exactly where the movement commands are and how I can use them without causing any problems. Because as you may know, um, everything works together and uh, the parser basically, its main purpose is so that you don't do two things at the same time. So that you don't keep printing while you change filament because that would be absolutely dumb. And um, using G-code, the cool thing with process subcommand now is that it basically pauses the parser, takes the spot inside the parser, does everything you needed to do and then continues on normally. But since I cannot do that, I will have to uh, kind of uh, innovate on how I want to do this. So I will basically do something similar, but that gives me enough control so that I don't need to stay with the G code command. Um, now, uh, there is another problem uh, with using the extruder and uh, stuff motion. Uh, and while testing it because I don't have a thermistor plugged in and um, Marlin has a lot of security features and the one that is was was causing me problems was the uh, cold extrusion prevention feature uh, So I've disabled it for now, but if I re-enable it uh, I cannot actually develop anything and it was just basically doing when I was trying to move the extruder uh, it was saying me that the extruder was uh, the the nozzle was too cold which was true because I didn't have any thermistor plugged in and a thermistor how it works is basically a resistance and uh, the harder it gets the smaller the resistance is and when you don't have any resistance plugged in uh, it basically means that there's an infinite resistance so the temperature is infinitely low and uh, because of that I was basically triggering every single security feature inside Marlin and uh, I have currently disabled them inside the firmware, but I will have to re-enable them when I try to print stuff because this is what is uh, keeping Marlin and keeping your 3D printer from burning down your entire house. So um, yeah, I'm facing a few challenges on the firmware side of things, but I believe that they are all solvable and it will just take me a bit more time to really understand uh, how Marlin uh, works and it will be a understanding that is a lot deeper than what I have right now because uh, right now I understand all the basic functions, the g-code functions and um, all the main files that you're going to see inside the feature uh, but I don't really know what is behind that. I don't really know how they control directly the motors but that shouldn't be really difficult. It's probably similar to what you would do when you program a separate motor with a normal Arduino. I just need to find how they do it uh, because I want to be able to um, send that modification and put that notification on the official GitHub so that when you download the official uh, Marlin firmware, uh, it comes with this MMU2 clone feature uh, so that you don't have anything to code uh, afterwards. So uh, that's it for the uh, firmware side of things. I really hope you liked this video. If you did, uh, make sure to subscribe. If you didn't, post a comment why you didn't like it. Um, and I will see you next time.